Okay, so welcome everybody to the COVID-19 Alume Town Hall. Uh, today is May 6th, and so we've been doing these town halls for the last couple of months as we have dealt with the issues that come up with, uh, with COVID-19. Hopefully it's starting to feel like we're, um, you know, we're coming through the, the worst of it and, um, and that we can start to see a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, as we'll talk about in this presentation today, is they're going to start to lift some rest restrictions and hopefully make um, make it so we can we can start to come back out into the world a little bit. But um, but it's really important as we think about our responsibilities. Uh, all Alume employees, we are um, we're the front line of caring for very very medically fragile people. So rules that might apply to others as we start to uh, reduce restrictions in the community may not all necessarily apply to us as we will have to live at us at a higher standard uh, which I know is a lot to ask of all of you um, but it is it is um, it's important that that's how we we try we try to to uh, to operate okay so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and get us started let's see Okay, all right, so Alume Town Hall, May 6th, here we go. Um, so we're going to talk about recent uh, updates and things that have changed recently and uh, give you those, those bits. Uh, we're going to talk about some re the revised questions and symptoms that the CDC has put out. We're going to talk about the near horizon, what we think is going to happen with Alume um, and our community. We're going to talk more about PPE, and it's really important we all listen to this. There's a lot here on this particular talk about PPE. Uh, we're going to talk about the exposure risk assessment process, which we touched on last time, but we're going to go a little farther. And the sick pay benefits, we're going to go even farther with that and uh, release our official policy on that um, out to all of you later today or tomorrow. Uh, also, the COVID-19 return to work. Um, we have some documentation reminders and, of course, all the things we're doing to make sure we stay safe at the peak of COVID-19. So, here we go. Uh, so, we have the power to make a huge difference, right, to our communities. And hopefully, I know that all of you are. And um, evidence of that is that we've been able to really keep our families and patients safe. Uh, we've had very little... Uh, spread. Only uh, two of our nurses have tested positive. None of our patients, knock on wood. Uh, everyone has done a tremendous job in keeping our, um, our community direct, directly that we care for safe. Um, and we haven't spread it to each other, which is also really, really important. Um, so I thank you all for all the things that you've been doing and uh, ask that you please continue to keep an elevated level of awareness and stewardship around um, the responsibility we carry for COVID-19 in our community. So again, our biggest risk for our patients is that someone brings COVID-19 into the home, given that most people are not taking any visitors at this time, hopefully no one in the state of Connecticut right now is taking visitors in their homes. Um, the, 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 we are the only ones coming and going along with their family members. Therefore, the, the biggest risk that they have now and until there is a, um, a vaccine, the biggest risk is going to continue to be us. So we have to really live at the highest level of um, impeccability around, uh, around our, our level of safety. So our first level of defense is really PPE. I have to tell you, PPE is the way. Um, you know, if you're using PPE in the homes, you are going to keep yourself safe and you are going to keep your patient safe. Um, you absolutely want to diminish your exposure as much as you possibly can, even in the months as the restrictions start to lift. Uh, and the cleaning and disinfecting will continue to be of utmost importance um, in your environment when you're working as well as at home. So our current status uh, here shows us as of last end of last week that a total of 26,000, almost 27,000 COVID-19 cases uh, are present in the state of Connecticut with 2,200 almost deaths associated with COVID-19. You can see that the hotspots are Purple County, uh, Hartford, and New Haven, uh, but there certainly are, you know, 
throughout the entire state, we are experiencing um, COVID-19 COVID, uh, COVID infections. So some uh, changes in home health that have happened in the last week that are of, of importance to us. And for those of you out in the field, it's, it's probably less, uh, less something you think about um, than, than for those of us in the office and the case managers. Um, but they did officially release an executive order um, in allowing for us to, um, to have APRNs and physician, physician assistants um, be able to sign off on our orders, which helps us tremendously. So that's a good positive thing that's come up. CDC also recently changed, or rather added, some symptoms of COVID-19 that they want us to be screening for. So, um, and the way they look at it is like this. If people have cough or shortness of breath, then, then that's a stop right there. It's a screen that um, those two things um, could mean that the person has COVID-19 and uh, you should consider them uh, a risk and give them a mask if they don't already have one on them and report it to the office. Um, they're saying either one of these or at least two of these and that's they've had, they've put fever, chills, repeated shaking with chills, muscle pain, headache, sore throat, loss of taste or smell. Actually some of these are not new but any combination of these two uh, is what is what they're looking for. So this is a slight change that's come about. Um, so we're going to be updating this um, flyer and distributing that back out to you so that the symptoms include those other other symptoms, which of course include uh, chills, um, muscle pain, headache, and loss of taste or smell. So um, just to give you a little head, uh, update on where we are as a company, um, our office is now, we were before open two or three days a week for a couple of hours each time. Now we are back to being open um, at uh, Monday through Friday, nine to four. There is one person in the office, uh, a fulfillment team member is on, on site at all times to answer phones, to collect our packages, and, just, and also to do the important fun a function of uh, distributing PPE to all of you. And we'll talk more about that. But one of the changes that's coming um, starting next week is that we will not be distributing PPE any longer to our home, into, into the homes for everybody to just sort of use at will. It will be instead, each person on the team will need to uh, be responsible for their own PPE. So you'll come to the office You'll collect your PPE that you need it. It'll be given to you, distributed to you based on the number of shifts that you work over a period of time. And, um, and so that way you get to be sure that you have the PPE you need and, and it doesn't run out because it will be in your possession and you'll keep it with you uh, at, your, at all times and not leave it in the patient home. Um, and it'll also help us um, make sure that uh, we're using the PPE as, as it's intended and responsibly, um, there is a major shortage issue going on across the state and across the country. And um, so we have to be really careful and vigilant. We, we don't wanna be in a situation where some houses don't have any PPE because they've run out and other houses um, you know, you know, do, but it's they have more than they need. So, so we wanna, we're going to be very careful and thoughtful about how we distribute PPE going further starting next week. And we're gonna distribute it directly to you um, based on the number of shifts that you have in a given week or in a given two week period. You're gonna see that, um, the, so the stay, stay safe, same home, stay home, stay safe uh, order is in effect until May 20th. Uh, we expect that that is going to um, they're going to make some announcements about what happens after May 20th. Some businesses will start opening with some modified rules of operation. I know um, that hair salons and um, other similar restaurants and some other businesses are starting to open along with some daycare and child care facilities that were before not able to be open. Um, there will be more restrictions though with how they do business. There will be operational restrictions um, that, that they won't be just business as usual. Um, so other restrictions may be lifted May 20th, but schools will remain closed and social distancing will remain in effect probably for a very long time. Um, schools will remain closed 
through they're saying until uh, July and then in July they're, they're saying that at that point they'll have the ability to start opening uh, for summer school and um, for for certain for camps as well so child care camps and summer schools opening July with moderate modified operations uh, they're talking about how they're going to open um, schools also in the fall and it looks like it'll be on a different kind of schedule sort of a blended schedule where people some some kids will be in the building one day and then at home the next and vice versa. Um, so it's, this is gonna continue for a while. We expect that our company will continue to, to function in a quasi virtual fashion. Um, and um, you know, we expect that many rules will remain in effect for the next 12 to 18 months. So all of our PPE rules of wearing cotton masks, reusable gowns and eye protection uh, with, with our patients who are non COVID positive um, plus any PPE, if we have any COVID positive patients, then we obviously need to, to use the, the, the rules that the CDC sets for us with that. Um, then with virtual meetings, we're gonna continue that as well. We're gonna have an, a limited number of people in the office at any one time. There'll be likely shifts of people who can come and go um, so that we do not have team members who are uh, backups for each other. Um, you know, in the office at the same time. And uh, if that if they are there, that it's very rare and that they're covered in PPE uh, and at a safe six foot distance. Um, and then, you know, the other is still with our case managers in the office and anybody who is a, uh, is on a team with, uh, with other nurses and you're, and you're, you're friendly with each other, we, we're gonna ask you to continue to keep a uh, solid distance from each other uh, until until this this situation is fully resolved. So let's enter into our discussion around PPE, which is you know ever changing and so exciting. I know. So this is what the PP, this is what the CDC guidance gives to home health agencies. It's it says that for you know re everyday routine home health care, which is what we are, that we should be using surgical masks or a cotton mask. That's all that they're recommending at this point. They also say that if you're working with a pediatric, um, pediatric routine care of pediatric patients um, and leukemic patients, um, then it's basically the same thing um, where you, you still use a surgical mask or a cotton mask. Then if you have a patient confirmed or suspected of COVID-19, then you start to use the N95. You use one a week, but potentially daily based on the visit volume. And um, again, if there is no N95 available, then you could use a surgical mask or a cotton mask. The, with, with a COVID-19 positive patient, the CDC requires eye protection, gown, and gloves. Um, and so, uh, if there is an aerosol procedure being done with a COVID-19 patient, then the rest, the N95s required, eye protections required, gown and gloves are required. So you'll notice that the CDC doesn't require um, for routine care of pediatric patients or typical or adult patients, doesn't require more than a mask, but we um, at Alume ha would like to have a higher standard for that to protect our patients. So we feel our patients are particularly vulnerable um, and, he, and the reasons why are that, uh, their level of medical fragility and their comorbidities. Um, also the frequency and length of home health services. So um, the fact that we're there a lot, um, in some cases, three times a day, three shifts a day, plus, in a, plus the, uh, the skilled nursing visits that come in, um, and the number of, of home health providers who are in the home. So, um, you know, we might have you know five or six or eight different um, providers that are in and out of the house. So it's we're at a higher level of um, they're at a higher level of exposure from us because we are in the home more, and we're also at a higher level of exposure from them because we're in the home more. So we believe that our standards should be set above the CDC guidelines, and so everyone needs to understand um, that you know, the PP, what the PP rules, PPE rules at Alume are, and we need for you to be reusing PPE so supplies appropriately, and we need everyone to be responsible um, 
as we really have very limited resources to do this. So we, we have a higher standard than is what's necessary, um, but we also, what is advised, I should say, but we, um, but we need your help. Um, you can't just, okay, well, knowing that you need to have gloves and mask and, and um, gown on, that, that um, you need to make sure that, that you're doing everything you can to use the, for example, example, the cotton masks. No one should be using surgical masks at this point, except for the case managers. Everybody should be using their cotton masks and reusing them, um, washing them after every uh, use. Um, there's just not enough surgical masks to go around, and it's also um, extremely expensive. So the same thing is true with the gowns. We're going to be distributing the gowns out to everybody. We want you to be able to wear them and, and be safe, um, but it's important that you, um, that you don't just idly reuse and reuse the, um, the yellow or blue um, disposable gowns um, because there just aren't very many in the community. And, um, and so it's not just the supply that we have within a lume or the supplies you have within the home of, of a particular patient, but it's also the supplies that are, avail that are available um, and that we have to share with the larger community. So we need everybody to understand that sort of big picture and get on board with how to use them. So we've had a personal protective equipment plan for a while. Um, and so there should be an emergency starter kit in every home. And this is in the event that someone in the, that, that a patient has COVID-19 or is suspected of it. And I will tell you that we have no patients with suspected COVID-19. So not a single one of these emergency starter kits should have been opened and used at this point. So it's really important that everybody not use what's that, that starter kit. If, if that starter kit doesn't have five basic masks, three N95 masks, four yellow gowns, one eye shield, and, and a box of gloves, if it does not happen, it does not exist in the home, then we please let Taylor know so she can make sure to, to have the case manager bring that out. But please don't use those. That is for that is for you know an emergency only. And I can tell you there are no emergencies. There are no and uh, patients with COVID-19. So if someone were we were to have a patient who was actively with COVID-19, then we would start to bring in all these other things on a on a really you know very frequent basis. Again. We're not doing that right now because we don't have any COVID-19 patients. So then what we come over to is what our standard employee personal PPE kit is. And we have been, up till now, we've been distributing supplies into the homes. And what we found is that what we put in the house expecting to be maybe a month's supply is being used up in a week. And we need um, to make sure that doesn't happen because we just simply don't have the supplies. We can't get them. Um, so we don't wanna have one week, everybody has tons of supplies and then for three weeks, nobody has any supplies. That, that's, that's a recipe for, uh, for failure here. So we need everybody to take personal responsibility. And this isn't just at Illume, this is happening everywhere where everyone needs to take personal responsibility for their own PPE. And so starting next week, you will come to the office to check out your PPE. And the amount you'll be given is based on how many shifts you work in a week. So um, we will start to distribute. Um, you should all have cotton masks at this point. So we're not gonna be distributing more cotton masks. You should have that. We will not be distributing surgical masks to you. It is your responsibility to use the cotton masks. Um, you must wear and wash your cotton masks and not at your shifts be using um, the, uh, the, the other surgical ones. Um, that's in the purpose of, of conserving and using what we should. The N95, everyone's been given an N95 mask um, and that's been given to you. It should be given to you once. Really, we only use them if we um, have, have a uh, COVID-19 patient who's test positive, we don't have any. So there shouldn't be a reason for you to have to be wearing your N95s. Um, one set of protected eyewear distributed to you one time. Um, we just uh, just received the uh, eye shields. Many of you already received 
um, disposable glasses. Um, you'll get on your next time coming in to the office to collect your PPE, you'll get a you'll get a protective eye shield, and that will be distributed to you one time. It will be your only set that we give you, and you'll clean and use it, reuse it at every um, at every visit. So you will um, you will get one um, reusable washable gown for every patient you serve. So if you're a continuous care nurse and you take care of one patient, you'll get one gown. If you are a nurse who takes care of two patients, you'll get two gowns. Um, we will not be distributing disposable gowns. Um, so you must wear disinfect and store your gowns. Case managers will be able to have access to disposable gowns because of the way they interact with many patients in a day is different. Uh, but for continuous care shift nurses and home health aides, you'll be given one per patient that you serve, and it will be, it'll be the only thing you have. You'll have to use that, and um, you'll use a solution to spray it down. It's sort of it's a Tyvek um, material that um, that you can that won't tear. It's it's nice and strong, and you'll be able to clean it. Um, plastic aprons will be distributed as well. Those you can put, you can use one, one to two of those per shift uh, to put right over your gown. And everybody will be distributed their own um, amounts, their own uh, disbursement of gloves. So it's expect the expectation is is that one box of gloves should get you through at least five shifts. So if you come in and you work five shifts a week, we'll give and, and you're picking up two weeks worth of, of um, materials, we will give you two boxes. If you uh, work two shifts a week, then a two week supply would be one box, right? Because we would expect that you could get through four shifts with one box. Um, so that's how we're gonna measure it um, and how we're gonna distribute it. Everybody will come in, we'll sign in and sign out what you have. Um, and you know, obviously if you run out and you need more, you come back and you get more. Um, but we want you to be mindful of it and um, not use it willy nilly. Um, so, again, shift nurses and home health aides are used are using reusable cotton masks, not surgical. Uh, you'll spray before leaving the home with a solution of alcohol um, and and bring them home and wash them. Case managers can can use surgical masks. Um, the gloves you get one box for every five shifts you work. You'll pick them up from the office, no longer distributing to the homes. Each clinician is now responsible for ensuring you have the PPE you need. No waste will, will take place as a result. Um, get your goggles or eye shields this week if you haven't already. Um, one gown per, per nurse per patient, except for case managers. Um, the plastic disposable aprons will be distributed. Hand sanitizer, one large container per, per continuous care house per month and one large container per case manager per month, um, as well as uh, antimicrobial soap, very low supply. Please let us know if you're noticing the home where you are doesn't have it. Uh, we hope that they do, um, but if they don't, let us know. There isn't enough for us. We don't have enough to be able to distribute it to, to all of you. We simply cannot give it. Uh, clean and disinfect. So, um, Marie, are you on the line? You want to talk through this? If you are, take yourself off mute. Hello. 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 Oh, oh, oh boy. boy. We've got some, we've got some background. Yeah, she has to take off the computer. That's the only way she's able to do it. Are you still there? It's always something, right? Technical difficulties. Okay. <laughs> There you go. All right. So, do you are you able to see the screen? Hello, Marie. Are you able to see the screen? You know what? I'm just going to do this. This is good. So, goggles and face shield. So, while wearing gloves, carefully wipe the inside of the face shield. Okay. So, you'll want to. So, you'll have your gloves, and you'll want to wipe the inside. Goggles followed by the outside face shield, goggles using a clean cloth saturated with antibacterial solution. Uh, we are, we're going to distribute to everybody a bottle 
of, um, of cleaning solution that um, Jennifer Coleman so gracefully, great, graciously uh, packaged for everybody today. Um, you're going to carefully wipe the outside of the face shield or goggles using, a wipe, using that solution. Um, you're going to fully air dry and remove the gloves and perform hand hygiene from 20 seconds. So always clean it up all the way. The gowns, when removing the gown, first you want to untie the neck and back and, and bend and have the gown slip down. Do not touch the front of it. Um, the gown can then be sprayed with the solution um, that's given to you and then fold it into a paper bag or plastic bag and leave it in the patient's home. Um, you should write your name on, on the bag. Um, if you're at all concerned that, that's, that the, for whatever reason in the home you're in that the bag might disappear, then it might be okay for you to take it and put it in your trunk in your car and leave it there until you go back. Um, if you're going to perform an aerosol treatment, wear a plastic apron over your gown uh, remove the apron after the treatment, throw away into the garbage, and tie up the bag after this and throw it away. Ta and then take off your gloves. Um, take off and spray the isolation gown as described as above. So, so anytime you do an aerosol treatment, you'll want to um, re-spray down your gown. The isolation gown, um, if it's disposable, so everybody in, in continuous care, shift nurses and home health aides, your gown will be disposable or no, it won't be disposable, it will be um, reusable, but if you're a case manager, it'll be disposable, but then it must be discarded um, <coughs> and uh, put into the trash. Uh, it's your responsibility to notify the office if you need a new gown, if you are a case manager and you need more uh, disposable gowns. Um, so if the employee is given a cloth isolation gown, it's your responsibility to take it home and wash it. So it's this cloth, but it's more reusable. Tyvek doesn't really feel like regular cotton material um, and, and wash it. So um, then we're gonna wash hands with antibacterial soap or hand soap uh, every time before and after you, uh, you clean your gown. All right, and then we have, uh, let's see, surgical masks. Um, you, so again, surgical masks, you need to make sure you have at least your two cotton masks and clean them key, clean. Um, clinician to make sure you have enough masks. So if you're a case manager, you need to make sure you have enough masks. Uh, you're gonna wash your hands with soap and water for 20 seconds or put on hand sanitizer prior to putting on any type of mask. Um, when you're ready to remove your mask, take one ear pipe piece off at a time and spray with solution of water and uh, antibacterial solution, like the solution that Jen is preparing for you today. Do not touch the outside of the mask. Uh, then place in a plastic or paper bag and leave at the patient's home with your name on it. Um, clinicians should have a mask at each home. Um, if the mask becomes soiled or ripped, throw it away and ask for a new one if you are using ones that are um, disposable. So, um, that's a little confusing on this, just wanna make sure you understand. If you're using a, um, a, a cloth surgical mask, then you would take it home with you and be washed. If you're reusing a surgical mask, then this is, this is the instructions that you would, would follow. Uh, the N95 mask, it, it's, you only wear them if you have a patient who's positive for COVID-19. Um, it's probably also okay. Some of you may feel more comfortable using the N95 mask that you were given if you are doing a aerosol-like procedure with a, with a patient, that, that would also be fine. Um, but it should only be worn in one of those two circumstances to, to make sure we maintain um, enough in stock. Um, and if you have a COVID-19 positive patient, which we don't have, then you would wear the, the N95 throughout the entire shift, uh, remove the mask by taking off one ear at a time, sprayed with the above mentioned solution, wash your, you know, put it into the bag, keep the bag in the home, unless you think the home might disappear, in which case put it in your trunk, and wash your hands after the removal of the mask and put away uh, as such. Clean and disinfect. So that's, we got goggles, gowns, masks of all kinds. Does anybody have any questions about that?
All right, so again, PPE with COVID-19 patients. Um, Marie, do you have anything to add uh, on what I've kind of just said? Because you're the, you're the master of uh, the PPE rules. Or Amy, or Kyle. Okay then, I guess I got it right. We hope so anyway. Okay, so if the patient that is being cared for is COVID-19 positive, of course we have zero of those, the, clin the clinician will don and doff, I love that term, don and doff, PPE outside the patient's home. So it's important that you come to the home and on the porch or out in front of the home, that's where you put on um, your PPE. Um, PPE will ta be taken care of uh, best as it can during this short supply. Um, and gloves will be thrown out at the end of each shift. So um, these are specific rules for PPE with COVID-19 patients. Um, it's also been guided, as we've mentioned, that we wanna reduce, reuse, and repurpose our PPE as much as possible. Um, Matt, you know, reduce the, the use, uh, reuse as much as we possibly can. That's why we've given you cotton masks and we're distributing the, um, the Tyvek uh, reusable gowns, uh, the reusable uh, eye covers, uh, shields, um, really, and trying to really distribute um, the the you distribute the uh, the gloves to you individually, so that we reduce the overall use um, and repurposing wherever we can. Um, you know, using the Tyvek as an example of it uh, to the Tyvek to for the gowns. We did send out a, a CDC flyer on this in the past and we will distribute it again to you. So our COVID-19 exposure risk assessment. So this is sort of the overall, what everybody, how healthcare and the state of Connecticut is looking at exposure risk. And so it's looking at over here, this is what happens is if you are exposed at work or versus if you're exposed um, in a non-work environment. And so if you would come here first to the exposure at work, um, if you are working and you are exposed, if you think you, know, you, you were exposed by another employee or by uh, a patient, then you consult your manager and then you will be asked the question, is the are, are you the employee symptomatic or asymptomatic? So if you're symptomatic, you've been exposed and you're symptomatic, then you'll be you know, asked to wear a surgical mask and leave work. Um, you'll, we'll complete a report. Um, you will be looked at, you will look at um, the op options for you know, getting help and you'll, you'll speak out, you'll, you'll reach out to your doctor um, and be able to have a, an op a workers' compensation evalua evaluation if it was contracted at work. If you were asymptomatic, then the employee is allowed to continue to work um, wearing PPE and continue to self-monitor of watching for any changes uh, in, in, um, in symptoms. Um, and then if, if your symptoms start, then we again sort of go back to the same place where it says, okay, wear a surgical mask, complete the report, speak to your, uh, to your doctor or wellness clinic, and we do a workers comp evaluation. If it is non work, it is a non-work exposure. Then that, it's basically the same thing. It just doesn't go through workers' comp. So if you're asymptomatic, then then we say, okay, did you know how who were you traveling? Was it a community or home exposure? Um, and then as long as you're asymptomatic, we ask you to keep working, wear PPE, and um, if symptoms start, then we kind of come over here to what happens when symptoms do start and um, you consult your manager and you can use PTO and, and our uh, sick policy um, if, it, if, you fall, if you qualify for it. Um, also future non-advised travel. So as of March 6th, it's been advised that we don't travel and um, that will continue until we revise our, uh, our policy. So this is just another way to look at it. We talked about this before. So what are the COVID-19 sick benefits? So if you were to catch it um, either at work or elsewhere. 
So we go through a three-step process, and it's first we're going to determine your eligibility. Are you, yes or no, eligible? If so, how much eligibility do you have? How much can you be paid for COVID-19 sick time? And then three, what paperwork um, and documentation, what process do you have to follow in order to get these benefits? So um, basically we are offering two weeks of COVID-19 sick time um, that is to a maximum of 40 hours a week or 80 hours total. And um, the amount of time that you would be paid for COVID-19 sick time is based on your uh, permanent scheduled shift. So if you are a full-time employee who uh, works in the office and you get, uh, you get COVID-19, um, then you get 40 hours, or sorry, two 40 hour weeks of COVID-19 sick time up to, up to two weeks. If you are a nurse in the field and you uh, work 32 hours a week and that's what your permanent sign sh schedule is, then you could get two weeks at that 32 uh, hours a week um, up to those two weeks. So then once that is used up, if you're still ill, you can, can, you can use your PTO for any additional time should you choose. So when we look at eligibility, determine whether an employee is eligible for the COVID-19 six pay. So this is above and beyond whatever PTO program we are, you, know, you already have. So to be eligible for COVID-19 sick pay, all of these conditions must be met. The employee must have had direct exposure. The employee was not wearing PPE. Employee is COVID-19 symptomatic. The employee's physician determines in writing that the employee is at risk for being COVID-19 positive and has ordered a COVID-19 test or has ordered an employee self-quarantine. Um, so there must be, this is really key, this step right here, the physician has to say in writing that there is a COVID-19 risk and, and you've either had the test or getting the test or you have been, they're not giving you the test for whatever reason because of lack of, of uh, tests and there um, is a need for self-quarantining um, as determined by the physician. We need that in writing. If the employee is a virtual employee, then you do not get the uh, COVID-19 sick pay unless you are so sick that you can't work from home. If you are a virtual employee and you can work from home, then you do not have access to the sick pay. So first we determine whether you're eligible or not. Next we say how much COVID-19 sick pay is, um, are you eligible or is the employee eligible to receive? And again, this is based on First, what are your shifts? If you work 32 hours a week for a Lume, if, you, if the full time of, expo, of, of uh, sick pay is uh, 32 hours a week in two, two weeks, then you get two 32 hour weeks of sick pay. If the employee, um, uh, da, 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 da. if the employee should, should use all of the allotted two weeks of COVID-19 pay and still not be able to return to work, you may be able to use then your PTO, that's fine. If the employee is sent for COVID-19 test by his or her doctor and the test comes back negative, the time while the employee was awaiting results of the test is eligible for COVID-19 pay. So if the test took five days, so let's say on Monday you took the test and on Friday uh, you got the test back and the, and the test said that you were negative, then we would cover those five days. Um, the employee no longer has access to any remaining balance of COVID-19 sick pay once the negative results are delivered. Um, if the results are negative and the employee is not yet eligible to return to work, they may request to use the accrued pay time off. Um, so you could be sick with something else and that's what's causing it, it's not COVID-19. Um, if you are, if you receive a positive test, you are required to provide a letter to HR indicating, um, you know, evidence of positive result. So that's how much you get. So once you then are eligible and you know how much you get, the next piece is to make sure that you submit the proper paperwork and complete the process required. Um, so any employee who receives, utilizes this, this must provide uh, a letter from your doctor indicating that you were out sick due to COVID-19 illness or testing. Um, 
And you also must have either in the same document or a separate document, the date in which the doctor says it's okay for you to return to work. Um, make no mistake, this is part of our standard sick policy. If you are out for more than three days for illness, you must have a doctor's note to return. This is standard. Um, all employees who are being tested for COVID-19 or awaiting results will be required to submit a, a paid time off form in, indicating they will be using COVID-19 pay or accrued PTO or you just, it, you won't get paid, right? So it's just like any other use of PTO, you have to use the form. Um, all PTO forms will be submitted through payroll um, and the employee will, will be paid at the requested amounts um, if eligible and, and all the requirements are met. That's how that works. Okay, return to work. So it's said that the symptomatic healthcare workers and first responders, um, this, this is how, you, how quickly you can return to work. So they're saying that at least three days or 72 hours have passed since recovery as defined by not having a fever uh, without using fever reducing meds. So if you've got, you've had COVID-19, you're feeling better, you need three full days with no fever and um, no fever reducing meds. We also want to look for and see improved improvement in respiratory symptoms and at least seven days have passed since symptoms have first appeared. So it is possible, what they're saying here, it's possible that you could recover from this in less than two weeks. And as long as you have had three days without a fever, your symptoms have improved, then you could come back um, in as little as seven days. So we want to make sure that you adhere when you come back to respiratory hand, uh, hygiene, hand hygiene, cough etiquette, wearing PPE at all times. Um, and, you know, we want to be very careful about that. So a doctor's note, again, is always required when, when you're out for illness for more than three days, and this certainly would apply here. Just as a reminder, we did um, and have been in, in contact with patients' um, families, and uh, we let them know that we would be wearing gloves and masks at all visits, that gowns and eye protections would start, that uh, daily temperature screening of our employees is, has been happening, and that we are following our ri exposure risk assessment process, uh, and that we have dis discontinued over time to avoid burnout and, and to allocate resources for PPE. Um, and we've also asked our patients to make sure that everyone in the home participates in the four screening questions. So please make sure you do that. They'll expect you to do that. Uh, they, we want to have hope posted in the home. And if you just think about your, the house where you work, does it already have the four, four, four questions on, in the home? Uh, it should. If it doesn't, we need to get that out there for you. I'm going to be sending out a new form, a new uh, flyer that has the revised screening questions with the new symptoms. Uh, so you'll want to put those up in the house. Um, the third thing is, is that we've told them all to self-quarantine um, and we, they, that we expect to, to have uh, everyone in the home self-quarantining. Um, and I will tell you, we're not the only agency doing continuous care that is that is doing this. We are not alone. Um, I know there are other agencies that do continuous care who do not accept patients at all, will not care for patients at all with COVID-19. Um, we haven't taken that step, but, um, but I understand the spirit behind it to protect all of our patients. Um, and they, you know, and, and I think all of our, all the agencies that are doing this kind of continuous care work um, are requiring families to self-quarantine and, and to make sure that they are wearing masks in the presence of, um, of, of agency staff. So this isn't just us. If someone is in the home, um, is an essential worker, so mom or dad uh, is, you know, is going out all the time and, and uh, interacting outside the home due to work, it is expected that those individuals uh, wear mask and glove at all times in the home um, and that when they interact with the roommate team members that they wear masks and gloves especially. Um, there should be no visitors indoors and any visitors must be outside the home, and must maintain a six foot distance. Um, and in general, anybody, just again, 
you you have the right to require everyone that you interact with in the home to wear a mask. Now, your patient may not be able to. Some patients are able to wear masks and others are not. So there, there's some leniency there, but, but you are required to have mom and dad and grandma and anybody else, who, brothers and sisters who are in the house. When they're in your presence, they're in the same room as you, they should have on a mask. Um, so again, partnering with families, we've sent out education to them um, and we've suggested that they stay home um, and we've asked them you know, to participate in our four questions willingly. So if you have any issues that are happening in the house, and we've had a few and many of you brought, brought very important issues to us, uh, please let us know and we will uh, escalate. Let your, either your ambassador know or you can let your um, case manager or administrator know. All right, some documentation reminders, and this came um, from the clinical team. So Amy, if you're on and you wanna help me with this, this would be great. Um, otherwise I can make do. I can, pretend, I can pretend to be a nurse if only on TV, right? Are you there, Amy? Maybe everybody's on mute tonight. Okay, so we wanna make sure that a couple of important pieces of um, clinical uh, responsibilities are, are continuing. So especially since we've moved over to the electronic flow sheet, some pieces seem to be getting missed and we want you to make sure that you don't miss these pieces. So number one, the full head to toe assessment needs to be completed at the beginning of your shift. So every single time. A reassessment can be completed as needed, especially with changes in status. So you can always do another one. Very important, and I hear about this all the time, a narrative must be entered at the beginning of each shift and then every two hours, at least every two hours, it should be documented. And, um, and then again, at the end of the shift. So beginning every two hours and at the end, you must document a narrative. Education must also be documented at every shift. What was taught, who was taught, and response to teaching. So um, again, if you have questions about how to do that for your particular patient, especially if your patient um, in your mind isn't um, able to be educated, then be sure to speak to your case manager about that for some guidance on what would be some, some ideal education for each patient that you work with. Um, infection control kits are not an A. Every house and every nurse has gloves, gowns, masks, etc. cetera. So um, just to make sure that everybody is aware of that. So um, we don't, I guess that's a check mark or something. So you don't put in infection control kits um, as NA, you need, to, you need to document there about infection control, uh, especially now, people. Like this is really, like think about this. So in six months we'll have, or hopefully it'll be six months, maybe it'll be sooner, we'll have a survey and they're gonna come back and I guarantee you during this time of COVID-19, they're gonna come back to these months and they're gonna look for evidence of infection control. They're gonna to wanna to know you were washing your hands every 15 minutes and that you were just disinfecting at least every four hours. They're gonna to wanna to know that you wore gloves and masks and, and gowns. They're gonna to wanna to know that. And if you didn't document it, they're gonna say you didn't do it and you were operating in outside of the compliance of your, your companies, Illumes, the, your agency's PPE policy, which tells you to do it. So, um, I think that's what that means. And um, so you need to make sure that you, that you document what inf infection control uh, you, are, you are doing. Uh, scheduled shifts, very important. So if you will be late to your shift, contact your ambassador, your scheduler, or call the on-call scheduler. You're gonna be late. Um, don't call the family, call the scheduler. Uh, you can call the scheduler and then call the family, but first call the scheduler. If you need to call to leave a shift early, call 
again, the ambassador or the on-call ambassador. If you're staying past your scheduled time for any reason, be sure to contact your scheduler or on-call scheduler, okay? Um, you must speak with a human. Um, leaving a message um, is, is not enough. So if you leave a message and do not get a response in 20 minutes, you must contact a supervisor, all right? These details are extremely important, making sure we know when people are coming, when they are leaving, if they're staying long, all these things are extremely important for us to know. All right, so patients needing support. We still need lots of support. Uh, we need as many of you to pick up shifts as is possible, um, as long as you're not going in overtime. So if you have availability, please let us know. Um, so don't forget to do the staff screening form every day. Don't forget to wash your hands. Don't forget to clean and disinfect with every four hours. Uh, don't forget to wear your PPE. We've talked about that today quite a bit. Uh, limit your exposure to other employees. Um, very important. Travel ban, virtual meetings, no crowds, no handshaking. Can you imagine handshaking at this point? Uh, handle the food carefully. Limit number of people that you interact. Six foot limits, disinfecting, self-quarantine. Don't go to work when you're sick, right? And remember to take care of yourself, right? Maintain a routine, super important. Make your bed, meditate, breathe, go outside, exercise. Um, I've been reading, rereading a wonderful book called A Course in Miracles. I, I get a, like a chapter in every day and it's, it's, keeping, me health, it's keeping me healthy. Uh, also, I started a bullet journal uh, for myself and um, started one for my, for my Ella Pearl. Um, and uh, I give you, you know, I recommend that uh, you find some kind of a COVID-19 project that gives you something to sort of focus on that's um, fun for you. Maybe, maybe you decide you're going to um, do a garden or maybe you want to um, read a particular book or, or learn how to do calligraphy or maybe, you know, you've been wanting to do a mosaic or something. Um, come up with a project that allows your, your, your hands to be busy and your mind to be free and um, just creates a little bit of a soothing experience for, uh, for your overall well-being. Um, I hope you're all taking really good care of yourself, drinking lots of water. Stay away from sugar. Um, it's not good for you. It will, it will make your moods go up and down more than they probably already are. Um, you know, eat healthy as much as you can. Uh, it'll be tempting to, to eat those ding-dongs and Twinkies, but don't do it. It'll make you feel crappy. Um, take good care of yourself. Let me know if there's anything you need. Do you have any questions from what we presented today? Happy Nurses Week! Oh my goodness, I forgot to mention it. Happy Nurses Week to everybody. You're going to start to see some fun stuff coming out uh, on social media about it. And uh, we are going to be sending you all out a virtual gift via email. Uh, usually we bring everything that's a gift to everybody in, in the houses. We're not doing that this year to uh, protect us from COVID-19 exposure. So uh, just be aware that between now and Friday, you're going to get something in, uh, in the email, a little small gift from the team, from the leadership team. And um, we appreciate you. You are, got, you know, nurses really truly are the heroes of our generation. And uh, we appreciate everything you're doing. This, this year of, of uh, celebration should be off the charts. I hope you feel truly appreciated and valued. Um, if there's not any other questions, I'm gonna go ahead and, and end. Did somebody there have a question? Okay, well, thank you so much, everybody. I hope you have a wonderful day and um, go love up yourselves and your patients and uh, do everything you can to, to make this world just a little bit better. And I look forward to being with you again soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.